Hello, my name is Chris Chan. I work for Agatha Christie Limited as a researcher and an international goodwill ambassador. I'm presenting my talk, Absolute Justice, Agatha Christie in Buchenwald. Please note that this lecture will include some graphic details about the Holocaust. Though I have consulted several sources, at times I may mispronounce some names, so I ask for your indulgence on that matter, please. Thank you. In 1947, Agatha Christie received a letter from The Hague informing her of a stage adaptation of And Then There Were None that she'd never heard of previously. The letter was written by G.W. Friss, a Dutch former prisoner of war, who told her how And Then There Were None had helped him and his colleagues keep their hope and their sanity while being trapped in the Nazi concentration camp Buchenwald, located in central Germany. The following is the letter Frisch sent to Christie, unabridged and unedited save for correcting minor typographical errors, altering the title of the play to And Then There Were None, and removing the addresses of the sender and the recipient. Frisch's English is good but not perfect, so there are a few mistakes of tense and phrasing that may catch certain people's attention. The Hague, April 23, 1947. Dear Mrs. Christie, Being an officer of the Dutch administration in the Netherlands, East Indies, on the moment of the German invasion into the Netherlands on furlough in our country, I have been interned by the Germans during their occupation of our country. Together with my fellow prisoners, we have been hostages for the German citizens who were interned on the basis of the international laws by the Netherlands Indies authorities on the moment of the German invasion into the Netherlands, and we even remained in prison during the Japanese occupation of the Netherlands Indies. For more than four years, we have been interned behind the barbed wire fences in the concentration camp of Buchenwald and in four more camps in Holland. With several fellow prisoners, we have done everything to keep the morale of the hostages as high as possible and to bring them some entertainment, camp life being very dull indeed. So we organized a series of performances on the stage, primitive as it may have been, played by amateurs, of course, and the play also written by an amateur dramaturge. For one of our troubles was that we could not obtain the right play which fitted in our possibilities and our circumstances. Therefore, I have to write the plays myself, an entirely new job to me. Once I got your splendid thriller and then there were none into my hands, smuggled into our camp from the other side of the barbed wire fence, and it gave me the idea of writing a play in three acts based upon this novel. Our performance was a great success thanks to the very clever and perfect plot of your novel. At present, I am working at the Colonial Office at The Hague, Ministry for the Overseas Territories of the Kingdom, to be exact. And for some weeks, the pre-war entertainment club of this office has been re-established after having been lifeless during the German occupation. The committee wanted to organize a party for celebrating the revival of the club, consisting of a play and dance afterwards. Knowing about the performance of the And Then There Were None, under such strange circumstances, played and ridden by hostages in a German camp, the prisoners belonging to the Netherlands Indies Administration, which affairs in Holland are administered by the members of this club, the committee ached me to stage my play once again, now in full freedom. I agreed. The performance was fixed on May 20th, and the rehearsals started. I never thought about the copyright, our party being strictly reserved for members of the club and their guests, no charging for admission, and the press not being invited. Today I am informed about the existence of an authorized stage version of your novel. It is too late by now for stopping our rehearsals, the theater already being reserved for our party, and the other side, our very young club, not being able to pay the rights. Under these circumstances, I am applying to the author of the And Then There Were None for begging her special permission for our above-mentioned performance without any troubles about the rights of translations, staging, etc. If you would be so extremely kind as to give your consent, 
You are helping a young club without inconvenience for others, and our memories of our camp days will be much brighter. We would be very grateful indeed if you would comply with our request. Yours faithfully, G. W. Friss. This little discussed event gives us a fascinating look not just into not just one of the darkest aspects of 20th century history, but it also provides terrific insight into Christie's enduring appeal and how the strong moral themes of her works resonate with readers. In order to better understand the implications of this adaptation of And Then There Were None, I will go through the important points in this letter in order. The Dutch East Indies were a collection of colonies located across what is currently known as Indonesia. It is not clear exactly what position Friss held in the colonial government, but it was probably prominent enough to warrant the Nazis arresting him in order to drain the Netherlands of its leadership so as to better control the country during the occupation. The Nazi invasion of the Netherlands began on May 10, 1940, and the nation's primary defense forces fell four days later, though battles in certain areas would continue for a few more days. The verb tenses Fritz uses are a bit confusing. Upon first reading, it sounds as if he was back home in the Netherlands at the time of the Nazi invasion, and was arrested soon afterwards and imprisoned. When he mentions the Japanese occupation of the Netherlands Indies, a casual reading of the end of the first paragraph makes it sound as if he might have been transferred to a camp in present-day Indonesia, though it does seem unlikely that the Nazis would ship prisoners of war halfway around the world. The confusion of the last sentence is probably due to Friss's fluency in English. Friss states that he was held in prison for over four years, indicating that he was released after the fall of the Nazis in the spring of 1944. He mentions being held in Buchenwald and in four more camps in Holland. It is possible that he is not describing his experiences in order and was originally held in Dutch camps and then moved to Buchenwald. It was not unusual for prisoners of war to be moved around for various reasons, such as security, or to dissuade Allied bombings of certain areas for fear of killing Allied POWs. It is not known precisely when his internment at Buchenwald began and ended. It is necessary to provide some information on the nightmarish conditions at Buchenwald in order to provide a glimpse into what it meant to be imprisoned there. <clears throat> Buchenwald Concentration Camp was built in 1937. It had a very wide-ranging population of prisoners, including Jewish people, migrating ethnic groups such as the Roma and the Sinti, people who were labeled work-shy such as the homeless, members of the clergy, especially Catholic priests who preached against Nazism, political activists from certain socialist or communist groups who were deemed particular threats to the Nazi regime, Freemasons, currently held prisoners and recently released convicts, the mentally ill, the physically disabled, prisoners of war from across Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, and other unfortunate people who fell victim to the Nazi desire to rid their society of people they branded inferior or dangerous. Approximately 280,000 people were imprisoned at Buchenwald over the course of the Second World War. 56,545 of them died or about 20% of the total prisoners. The vast majority of the prisoners were men, with less than a thousand of the captives being female. Some of the earliest female prisoners were forced into a brothel at Buchenwald and sexually exploited by guards, but most of Buchenwald's female prisoners were jailed during the last year or so of the war. Buchenwald was technically a concentration camp, not a death camp which meant that the internees were not immediately marked for slaughter. Prisoners were generally not tattooed, but just because the prisoners were supposed to be imprisoned and left to live inside the camp, rather than murdered in gas chambers and other horrible manners, that did not mean that life expectancy was high. Poor food and minuscule portions led to all sorts of health issues, and close quarters and wretched medical care led to outbreaks of various diseases such as consumption. Many prisoners were forced to toil until they dropped, 
chopping down trees and other forms of harsh manual labor until they were literally worked to death. Twisted science experiments were performed on many inmates who were injected with various chemicals and diseases, operated upon and otherwise mutilated. Furthermore, many guards and camp officials murdered inmates as they pleased. Some were simply shot and died swiftly, being spared extended suffering. Others were not so lucky. One infamous sadist, Walter Summer, was dubbed the hangman of Buchenwald due to his habit of torturing inmates by hanging them by their wrists upon trees, and the howls of agony led to the woods being dubbed the Singing Forest. The fates of two Catholic priests, Matthias Spanlong and Otto Neurer, are debated, as some commentators say they were crucified upside down at Summer's orders, while other researchers say they were hung, and other reports suggest death by beating or medical experimentation. Two of Buchenwald's most sadistic officials were the married couple Karl Otto and Ilse Loch. Karl Otto was placed in charge of Buchenwald for most of the first four years of its existence. During his first year there, he married Ilse, who was working as a guard. Many women worked as guards at predominantly male camps. The two soon developed a reputation for extreme cruelty. Under the Lux's tenure, prisoners were routinely robbed and tortured, allegedly being beaten, physically and sexually assaulted, and mutilated. Ilse had a reputation for profligacy, and rumors abounded of her having affairs with other officials and bathing in Madeira wine. Ilse also had a reputation for being fascinated with tattoos, and when prisoners were discovered to have interesting tattoos or other birthmarks, those individuals frequently disappeared. Ilse soon dis developed a collection of tattoos on tanned human skin, which were turned into lampshades and other items decorating her rooms. The Lux reputation for ill treatment soon became too much for even the Nazi high command, though it is possible that Karl Otto's downfall was based more on his embezzlement of funds than it was for his inhuman treatment of prisoners. In any event, Karl Otto did not survive the war, as his poor reputation led to him being removed from Buchenwald and given a different position, and in April of 1945, after being convicted by a Nazi court of charges connected to excessive brutality and murder and embezzlement, he received the death penalty by firing squad. Ilse was acquitted of similar charges, but after the war, she was tried and convicted of various atrocities. Her life sentence was controversially reduced by General Lucius Clay, who believed that allegations of human skin lampshades were false, though in later years researchers verified many of the charges Clay dismissed. This led to a second trial, where Ilsa was again convicted and sentenced to life in jail in 1951, where she remained for 16 and a half years before committing suicide by hanging. This is just a very brief overview of the atrocities of Buchenwald, and the omissions are due simply to the nature of this venue. There is a vast amount of scholarship on the horrors of the camp that is readily available to anyone who wishes to learn more about this monstrous period of history. Moving back to prison life at Buchenwald, it is important to realize just how little there was to do in a POW camp as well as how desperate prisoners were to be distracted from the constant barrages of brutality and death. Books were often scarce and were frequently confiscated. Board and card games could lose their appeal after a relatively short time, and conversational topics depleted quickly. POWs with a background in certain topics might give lectures or teach classes. In his book, Captivity, Flight, and Survival in World War II, Alan Levine wrote that prisoners led a monotonous existence, so dull and empty that it was aptly characterized by one veteran who declared that he always subtracted the four years he had spent in prison camps from his age. He felt he had not really lived those years. The bleakness of camp existence was pervasive and led to depression. Camps were jammed full of prisoners, often had terrible sanitation, and the food was rarely enjoyable or plentiful. 
Amateur theatricals and other performances were one of the few creative distractions available. Dr. Lisa Peschel was a leading scholar on theater and concentration camps and ghettos, and has studied various productions, mainly in the concentration camp and ghetto Therenstadt in Bohemia and Moravia. In the book Unbroken, Louis Zamperini, a POW in the Pacific, recalled with affection a comedic British Christmas pantomime held at the camp. An inquiry with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum by me revealed that there are references to an underground cabaret at Buchenwald, but there is no evidence as to what material was performed there, except for some songs by Yara Seufer, a Ukrainian-born, Austrian-raised songwriter and satirist, whose uh, political works attacking Nazi tenants led to his imprisonment at Buchenwald, where he soon contracted typhus and died at the age of 26. Concentration camp amateur theatricals were performed by using whatever clothes and scraps of cloth were available for costumes, and usually using minimal sets. Interestingly, in some cases, guards were known to participate, sometimes in technical roles, sometimes in the cast, and more frequently as audience members. Fritz talked about how hard it was to find source material that appealed to the prisoners, and we may never know who brought a copy of and then there were none to the camp and smuggled inside. Fritz doesn't say what language the book was in, though it was notable that there was a German language edition of and then there were none published during the war. Given the international situation, Christie would not have approved of her works being sold in enemy territory, and it's pretty certain that Christie never received any money from the wartime sales. Like many authors, in some nations, unauthorized versions of Christie's work would be sold, and scrupulous publishers would keep all the profits for themselves. It is notable that there was a considerable audience for Christie's work in Germany at this time, despite the war. Friss also only gives some basic details about his reaction to the book, but it is interesting to see how the themes of justice is outside the law, the growing guilt of people who have gotten away with murder, and the general feeling of doom resonated with the inmates. Notably, Fritz had trouble finding a proper work to adapt. There were countless other mysteries and thrillers that might have made it to the stage. Yet, as Fritz said, nothing else felt right. Yet, and then there were none, certainly not a traditional mystery, had a special resonance. Could the inmates have seen the actions of Walter Sommer and Carl Otto and Ilse Locke reflected in the characters? Could the idea that somehow, somewhere, justice would be done against people who had taken human lives appeal to the prisoners? Might the depictions of a military man committing crimes on the battlefield, a judge sentencing a potentially innocent man to death, a policeman jailing someone who had done nothing wrong, a doctor killing a patient, an ordinary people standing idly by and allowing people to die, have struck a chord with people who saw such actions happening in their own everyday lives? This is all speculation, but it's definitely possible that the prisoners took a level of comfort in a story that depicts long-delayed justice finally being carried out, forcing killers to confront their own consciences at long last and at great emotional pain. In any event, the prisoners respond very well to the play, according to Friss, there is no information as to how the prison guards responded to the play. So what happened after Agatha Christie received this letter? On a couple of Finnish mystery blogs, a handful of people repeat the same quote, stating that Christie's agent denied the request to stage the play, declaring that business was business and that an unauthorized adaptation could not be allowed to be performed. I am uncertain to, as to how this conclusion to the story came about, but it seems to be only the one quote, in Finnish, shared amongst four blogs, I think that this is a bit of misinformation, though the origin of this tale is unknown. In contrast, the few English-language articles and essays that refer to this incident indicate that Christie happily granted permission and the one-night-only production was a great success. At this point, there is not enough information to find out what happened after the 1947 final performance. I have been hindered by my lack of knowledge of Dutch and by living across the Atlantic, so I truly hope that a Christie researcher with better access to the area 
and better fluency in the language will be able to tell the next chapter of the story. I have no idea what happened to Frist after 1947. I don't even know what his initials stand for. Nor do I know the names or fates of the other cast members. The only additional information I know about Frist is that shortly before he was imprisoned, he successfully defended a legal dissertation on colonial law in territories outside Java. Furthermore, I have no idea what happened to the script or if any copies of it still exist. Maybe there's a copy on archive or amongst the personal family papers of Fritz's descendants or the relatives of other people involved in the cast. There are a lot of unanswered questions, but I truly hope that some enterprising Christie historian will be able to make a critical discovery soon, and I, for one, will be thrilled to hear about these discoveries. And so that is the story of the production of Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None at Buchenwald Concentration Camp. Thank you all so much for listening to this, and have a wonderful day.